Okay. On to our next speaker, Juan Enriquez. He's done everything from sail the seven seas in search of new organisms to help negotiate a ceasefire in Mexico's Zapatista uprising. Along the way, he became the managing director of Excel Venture Management and the co-founder of Synthetics Genomics Incorporated, a synthetic biology company. He received his BA and MBA from Harvard and is the founding director of the Harvard Business School Life Sciences Project. Juan's written several books, including the recent bestseller, As the Future Catches You, How Genomics and Other Forces Are Changing Your Life, Work, Health, and Wealth. Juan will talk about a big gap in how we gauge the effectiveness of healthcare. So let's listen to Medicine's Missing Measure. So before I talk to you about Medicine's Missing Measure, let me um, first take you to Hollywood. So when you talk about Hollywood, the first thing you have to do is you have to be able to tell the bad guys, because otherwise you don't understand the movie. And the question becomes, so how do you tell the bad guys? And it's really pretty simple, right? <laughs> I mean, um, when you look at that, you know, you can tell pretty good guy, pretty bad guy. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that applies, of course, to cartoons, right? You know who the good guy is, you know who the bad guy is. And the weird thing is this has now become an international language. So even in Korean westerns, you, you can tell who the good guy is. <laughs> now, as you're thinking of that shorthand, now let's come back to this place. So, white hat, right? And how about these folks? And, and of course, part of the reason for that, or this public perception of that, is the FDA's mission is this. And pharma's mission is this. And there has been a history out there of some products that maybe should have been slightly regulated. And as you're thinking of that, what ended up happening is the FDA's gotten more and more of a white hat. Because there's been this ratcheting effect where there's more tests, there's more time, there's more this, there's more that. And the black hats have gotten sued so often that basically they've hung up their hats. And what ends up happening in a system like this is pharma's focus shifts. And it shifts from what used to be the core competence of pharma, which is I go out, I make a huge compound library, I test it, I develop it, and I sell medicines. And today's pharma's core competence more and more is merging, which is why you're seeing more and more of these pharma's come together, and then selling very aggressively much of what you have. And that has now gotten to the point where pharma's spending about two times more on sales and marketing as it is on R&D. And that's a very different business, right? This is not a business whose core competence is I have a bunch of really smart scientists that can discover stuff and bring them to market. This is more, I've got a whole bunch of lawyers who can arrange very complex mergers, and I've got a whole bunch of marketing people who can sell you that little purple pill, which, by the way, has a marketing budget higher and larger than Budweiser, just to give you orders of magnitude. And as you're thinking about that, that's beginning to make science moot in a bunch of these companies. <laughs> That, of course, reinforces this thesis that pharma's wearing a black hat because, you know, they're not even producing medicines. They're just selling them. And as you think of the dynamics in that system, one of the things you have to do is instead of treating the world as a black hat and white hat place, you have to start thinking, what would happen if you assume that the people working in pharma and biotech not only want to make a profit, but they also want to save lives. And that also motivates why they go to work in the morning. And if that is your thesis, then maybe they're wearing hats that look like this. <laughs> and as you think of a world that looks like that, and you think of the pressures on people in the pharma world today, this is the cost in billions of R&D investment by pharma. And this is the output in new medicines per year. And the reason there's a little hump in there 
is because there was an extra set of fees at the FDA to get rid of the backlog. It wasn't an increase in productivity. So take out that hump and basically what you've got is less and less medicines coming to market per year for a higher cost. When you graph that and when you figure out that the procedures per trial have increased like this, and you look at this and you look at the length of clinical trials and they've almost doubled, what ends up happening is you've got more time and more cost to bring one thing to market. And the net effect of that is for every billion dollars you spend, you get less and less. And that has been a trend line since the 1950s. So there's all this extraordinary science going on, right? You find the structure of DNA, you find restriction enzymes, you find recombinant DNA, you find DNA sequencing, human insulin, you clone Dolly, you sequence the human genome, and the cost per billion dollars keeps becoming less and less and less productive, which creates a certain incentive for people not to take more medicines to market and to sell the medicines they have. Over the last 60 years, the cost of new medicines created per billion invested has dropped by a factor of 100. In other words, you've got 100 times less output today than you did 60 years ago for every billion you invest. And that's a little bit like running Moore's Law in reverse. So as most of the world gets faster, better, cheaper, medicine does not, healthcare does not, and education does not. And it's not surprising that those are the places where the national debt is growing and where you're really busting budgets. Because it really doesn't make sense to invest in a system where you get less for investing more. And the secret is, we're not measuring these costs. Let's think about what these costs do. So say you go to a horse riding competition. Okay, and if you say, all right, Here's the hurdle rate. Well, there's a bunch of horses that are going to make it over that. Same thing with medicine. You put the cost of a drug at 100 million bucks, you'll get a lot of medicines making that hurdle. But if you put it up at an Olympic level, as you had by about 1987, there aren't as many medicines that clear that cost. And there are levels where I whole bunch of horses, almost no matter how talented they are, or a whole bunch of medicines, almost no matter how important they are, will not make that hurdle. And as you're thinking of the consequences of this stuff, a whole bunch of drugs, they don't even get tested. Because they show up and a couple of the accountants say, hang on for a second, you want to do personalized medicine for a small subgroup of the population, and you want to have a full clinical trial for that subgroup? or you want to go after some tropical disease or obscure disease or poor person's disease, we're not going to do that. Because the hurdle rate at this stage, yeah, I'll do a medicine. I'll take a risk. But at this level, I won't. And as you're thinking about that and the consequences of that, there is a cost to not acting. So beta blockers were allowed in Europe before they were allowed in the United States. It's much easier in some cases today to get a CE mark in Europe. So you're seeing more and more things come to medicine, come to doctors in Europe than they do before the United States. In the case of beta blockers, that actually made a difference because that may have killed about 119,000 people over seven years. And if you think of you know, the shenanigans and problems that Martha Stewart and the other groups had, you know, it was all very entertaining and you know, Martha in pinstripes was an odd image. But that three and a half year delay in IL-2 may have killed 25,000 people while we got through that legal wrangling. And if you think about TB, well, you know, at a billion bucks, it's a poor person's disease. It doesn't affect that many people in the United States, so why would you go out and develop a drug for TB? But that's killing about two, billion, two million people a year. And if you think of malaria, that's killing somebody about every 30 seconds. And if you think of the international AIDS vaccine, that's mostly being funded by nonprofits because it doesn't make sense for a corporation to go out and do this for the most part. Never mind tropical diseases, less than 1% of the 1,300 drugs approved have gone to tropical diseases because there is a consequence to raising that hurdle rate from here to here to here to make 
99% safe, 99.4% safe, 99.9% .9 safe. When you do that, you have to measure the cost of what you're asking for as well as the cost of what you're protecting. Because we don't explicitly measure this cost, it is conceivable that even within the FDA, there might actually be a few of these. Which takes us, obviously, to the topic of traffic jams. <laughs> what? Clear connection. So it used to be that along the Washington Beltway, cars actually moved. <laughs> I know this is really surprising, but in the late 70s, cars moved along there. And the weird thing was, there was this one strange spot where every morning, same time, huge traffic jam. And it was driving the good citizens of Washington, D.C. absolutely nuts. They could not figure out what was happening. So the traffic engineers went out, they looked for bumps, they looked for problems, they looked for stoplights, nothing worked. And somebody wrote about it, and then a letter came in. And the letter said there's this one idiot who gets on, same time, same place, every morning, goes to the left-hand lane, sets cruise control at 49 miles an hour, goes for miles. A couple of days later, a letter comes in the Washington Post saying, Dear Washington Post, my name is John Nestor. I'm the person who drives in the left-hand lane at 49 miles an hour. The law says 50, I stay within the law. It is more convenient for me to drive in the left-hand lane because then I don't have to move when I go to work every morning, and I'm pretty consistent about going to work every morning. I can't tell you the fury that was unleashed by this letter, right? These furious letters coming. I've driven past this idiot. I honk at him. He never moves, da, 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 da. The citizens were so outraged they coined a verb. It was called nestering. <laughs> Pop quiz. Guess where John Nestor worked? This behavior got so bad that John Nestor actually got fired from the FDA for not acting, which is, believe me, a hard thing to achieve. <laughs> Ralph Nader sued. Ralph Nader's argument was, the letter of the law says you should not approve a drug until it is proven safe. John Nestor didn't have evidence drugs were 100% safe, and therefore he could not approve them. So he's reinstated, and this is the general counsel's memoirs, basically saying, I really hate to reinstate you. I don't think you're going to change your behavior, but I have to reinstate you. So John Nestor finished his career at the FDA, and at the end was given an award as an unassailable record for protecting the public from harmful drugs. Which is true, because apparently he never approved a drug. <laughs> right? Perfect record. Now, the only problem is one of the things he was doing is he was in charge of the renal and cardiac drugs. And there might be some consequences if you don't approve renal and cardiac drugs for a while. Which leads to an interesting obituary because John Nestor died of renal failure. And as you're thinking of you know, the cost of acting and the cost of not acting, what happens if you do things and what happens if you don't do things? Maybe at some point, by not acting, by being too careful, by making it too expensive, maybe we're actually killing more people than the regulations say. And the question you have to ask yourself is, what's the crossover point for this? And the answer is, we don't know. Because we don't measure this stuff. And that's medicine's missing measure. Because we're certainly measuring so-and-so had the side effects from X, and the CEO ends up in a West Texas courtroom for the next five years, and the cost of the medicine goes up another $100 million, and the universities and the IRBs get more conservative, or so-and-so had a conflict of interest, and all of a sudden, you know, no Harvard professor is going to go on a board of X, and the incentive systems go down, the incentive system to act, the incentive system for entrepreneurs, the incentive system to invest. And because we don't explicitly measure the cost of acting and not acting, 
here's what the FDA ends up doing. So in all, this is a former commissioner of the FDA. In all the FDA's history, I'm unable to find a single instance where a congressional committee investigated the failure of the FDA to approve a new drug. But the number of times when hearings were held to criticize our approval of new drugs have been so frequent, we're not able to count them. The message to the FDA staff could not be clearer. There are consequences to this kind of behavior. However, you don't have to jump out a window because there are instances where you can get around systems like this. And sometimes if you act, you get results. And there's some pretty reasonable examples of this. Right? There was this little group called ACT UP and basically they said, we're not going to die while you wait. And silence equals death. And when you act that way, when you start wearing jackets that say, if I die of AIDS, forget burial, just drop my body on the steps of the FDA. And when you start taking over the FDA with protests, and when you start putting out posters that look like this, And when it becomes a political issue, here's the kind of curve you get. Very complex disease, but a couple years after discovery, you've already got a diagnostic approved. And a couple years after that, you've got a medicine on the market. And a couple years after that, you've got a whole bunch of medicines on the market, and that death curve goes way up, and then it comes crashing down. Because when you force some of this stuff, when you act up, you can get medicines to market faster, better, cheaper. Now, does that make, mean we don't make mistakes? Does that mean there aren't some bad actors out there? Does that mean there aren't some people who will abuse the system? Nope. But if we try and make the system 100% safe, if we try and take every instance where there's an adverse reaction and say, well, let's take another three years to study it the next time. There may be consequences to that, and those consequences may be really serious. Until you act up and you get a curve that looks like that. There's a second instance where you can see this. There is nothing that makes more sense from a taxpayer or public policy point of view than vaccines. Now, the nasty little secret is vaccines don't always work for pharma. Why? Because if you're a pharma exec, would you rather sell somebody a pill every day for 10 years, or would you rather give them one vaccine and not see them for 10 years? So there isn't the biggest financial incentive on the vaccine side, but you know, from a public policy viewpoint, from a taxpayer viewpoint, vaccines are a really good idea. And they're effective, which is why you can get rid of smallpox and go from this to this. And by the way, the decrease in mortality because of vaccines for diphtheria, polio, tetanus, whooping cough, measles, mumps, rubella, was really pretty spectacular. And the cost effectiveness per dollar spent is also pretty spectacular. So this stuff works, but we came damn close to killing this industry. In 1967, there were 26 vaccine manufacturers. By 1986, there were three. And two of those were about to go out of business. And one of the things that happened is people said, we really do need vaccines. And finally, you got these two laws passed in 1986. And basically, they say, look, we're going to cap liability for vaccines. Right? So if you have an adverse reaction from vaccines, and some people do have adverse reactions to vaccines, we're going to cap the liability. We're going to discuss it rationally. We're going to discuss it in a court where the judge actually knows vaccines, vaccine therapy, et cetera. And by doing that, you enormously increased the output of vaccines. And now what you've got is tables like this from 2012 that basically tell you, OK, here's all the vaccines. Here are the injuries. Here's how many led to death. Here's how many people were compensated. Here's how many people were dismissed. And we're having a rational argument about risk benefit, which, by the way, is the kind of argument we have about staircases, because staircases are dangerous things. So are rugs. So is peanut butter. 
so are elevators, so is electricity, so are cars. But we found a rational way of discussing this in much of our lives, but not in medicine. And because of that, the IRBs in our institutions are saying, well, let's think about it for another six months, because there's no cost. And Congress is saying, well, let's have a few more years of testing. And the FDA is saying, well, you know, for a vaccine trial, let's do it because we're testing it on healthy people. Let's try 100,000 people for a first trial. And that means a whole bunch of vaccines don't come to market until you protect them. Now, when you do protect them, when you cap the liabilities, when you're rational about risk, you can eliminate not only smallpox, but maybe even polio. The odd thing is other diseases have very small act up movements. I don't understand why medicines for things like cancer, when you have a diagnostic that looks like that, don't lead to massive street protests as the AIDS drugs did. I don't understand why personalized medicine coalitions or tropical drug coalitions aren't angry about this stuff, why they're not acting up. And maybe the reason they're not acting up is because they don't understand medicine's missing measure. What is the cost of not acting? Thank you. So I should have known you'd be extremely provocative when you took your jacket off. That should have, that should have been the signal. Um, but in a society that continues to see kind of winners and losers in bringing new treatments and diagnostics um, to the medical community, what, what is the way to advance this notion of the, the missing measurement? Look, uh, there, when you look at the regulations that folks go through and you look at the forms that people go through and the GMP compliance, what, what we've done is we've taken all innovation possible out of the system. Because if you, change your, if you know that your manufacturing process for a vaccine or for a medicine can be better, you won't change it because you'll have to recertify the entire plan. And it will take you months. So you know how to fix this thing. You know how to make it better. You know how to not make vaccines in live chicken eggs that you have to move like this. But you don't do it because that's the way you do it. That's the way it's approved. That's the way that the inspectors work. And therefore, why change it? Second thing is there is no incentive today for pharmaceutical companies to follow up on adverse events because you have to report them. So you get through the clinical trial and then you just don't want to know. Because if you know, then you got to talk about it. And, and that leads to a system where we can't have talks about adverse events. And when you think of the previous presentation on reactions to medicines by cancer cells, that's the kind of research you probably would want to carry out on existing medicines, but you wouldn't do it because you're putting that medicine's approval at risk. And, and the system is really biased towards not acting. And it's, it's a really dangerous system. Now, if you take it piecemeal, if you say, I'll fix this little regulation, I'll fix that regu little regulation, we're not going to hand, get a handle on those health care costs. If we don't take a systemic axe at this stuff and say, measure the cost of what you're asking for systemically. What is the disability life years that are implied in a five-year approval process versus a three-year approval process? Now, not for medicines like Rogaine, okay? I care about Rogaine, but most people don't care about Rogaine. <laughs> so if Rogaine comes to market three years earlier or five years later, I don't care. Vaccine, I do care. Personalized medicine for cancer, I really care. Medicines for diabetes, I care. We talked a lot um, in, um, in the previous presentations around leveraging big data. Mm -hmm. Do you see a role of... Um, big data in facilitating uh, the work of the agency and the work of pharmaceutical companies and other life sciences researchers? It, it depends entirely on how big data is used, right? Because if big data is used to bludgeon people and say, we found that there's an obscure effect that occurs in 0.01% of people over here and therefore spend another three years doing this. You do stupid things like take a key medicine for MS off the market until the patients go absolutely nuts. And you don't measure that using the other medicine 
may hurt more people than the side effects of the first medicine. Because we're not having rational discussions about this. We're having discussions in courtrooms. We're having discussions in settlement places, and we're doing it in places where it's become an industry. And, and we've created a bunch of folks who are in bureaucratic positions who are absolutely terrified of going before a congressional committee that looks just like this, with the lights right on them, saying, why in the hell did you kill Aunt Susie? Right? Well, because in the process of killing Aunt Susie, 100,000 people were saved. And I'm really sorry that there was a side effect to X, but there's a side effect to peanut butter. There's a side effect to bee stings. There's a side effect to electricity. And the discussion we have to have is, what's a rational way of dealing with risk? And, and Britain's been very smart about this. They've got the concept of disability life years. Well, you've got me started on completely non-controversial topics. <laughs> One of the things we should be thinking about is, why are we backloading all of the health care? Right? Go ahead, run along, and by the time you get to 65, we'll give you Cadillac health care. But if you're two years old, we won't do the vaccines. We won't do the basic prevention. We won't do the basic nutrition. Shouldn't it be exactly the opposite way? You've had 65 years to build your savings to establish a community, to have a family that loves you and cares for you. And at that point, they should take care of your health care. But when you're two years old, when parents are just starting, that's where you should be covering the basic of health care. And by, by the way, in terms of disability life years, the amount you gain for investing $1 on basic health care at two years old is very different from investing it somewhere else. And I realize that may not be the most popular thing to say in a group like this, but hey. <laughs> well, why not? Um, last but not least, one of the themes uh, in um, your presentation as well as in others really centered on the notion of patient empowerment and patient scientists. How, how would you see um, patients or just plain people um, invigorated to really um, pay attention to this area and to what would your call to action to them be? You know, I. I think we're living in an era of absolutely extraordinary discovery. I think big data, I think personalization, I think looking at individual patients, individual cells, really has the potential to do some very, very interesting, important, exciting stuff. But all of our system is structured on averages. And that previous presentation as to what averages mean in cells actually applies to averages in individuals. Because some of us look at a hamburger and gain weight, and others eat five hamburgers and nothing happens. And it's the same thing with cancer treatment. So if you take chemo, you take something like 5-FU for colorectal cancer, the difference in the absorption rate on 5-FU can be 50-fold between individuals, not 50%, 50-fold. And we're prescribing medicines based on you've got cancer, step on this, you weigh this much, take this much because that's what the clinical trial told us on average. That is galactically stupid, okay? It makes much more sense to have a diagnostic, and, and take this with a grain of salt because this is one of the companies we've invested in, but, but the reason why we've invested in this thing, the reason why we're excited about it is if you can actually measure the absorption rate for chemo, you can double the lifespan over the latest, greatest drug, except it doesn't cost 50,000 bucks to do it, it costs 5,000. So as you think faster, better, cheaper, there are ways of doing this stuff. And there's no reason why you can't do that in medicine. There's no reason you can't do that with the brains that are in this room. But this system is really working to make sure that doesn't happen. And the only way to go after it is to go after it with a great big sledgehammer that says, what was the cost of your not acting? At an IRB level, at a university level, at a researcher level, at a pharma level, and at an FDA level. Because if we don't start asking those costs, then we're just going to focus on the other side of the equation. 